Good evening. I'm a reporter from the Evening Herald and I want to know what you think about these issues. Uh, what issues? Well, do black lives matter to you? I'd, I'd like to know where you stand on this. Uh, you don't want to deal with that. Um, what about re-electing President Trump? Uh, was he good for America or was he bad for America? Uh, was something closer to home? Well, uh, was Labour firm enough in its stance on ending the lockdown? Or do you think that Boris was actually right on this? Where do you stand on these issues? That's what I want to know. <laughs> Does that sound familiar? Uh, we get a lot of that on the internet, on radio and television. It's what you could call single issue politics. Uh, and single issue politics looks at issues from a point of view of black and white. Yes and no, right and wrong, because they just want to know where you stand. And we can get swept along by those sorts of uh, approaches and we're tempted to ask ourselves, well, what do we think about these issues and other issues? Um, and what is my opinion on them? Everyone else seems to have an opinion or liking this opinion or disliking that one or friending this or unfriending that. Uh, what would Jesus do in such and such a situation? The basic question for us Christians is whose side is God on? Is he on our side? Now that type of thinking is not new. It's been around for a long time. In fact, it's as old as the hills. And I'd like to call into this debate four witnesses from history. A general, a political leader, a woman of doubtful reputation, and a president. And those two are, latter two, are in no way connected. Because they're not all from America. No, they're not. Actually, they're all from the Bible. So let's call the first witness. He is Joshua and the witness is from a military camp. He has been given the task of leading Israel into the promised land. Moses has just died and Joshua has led the people across the Jordan River and the first place they come to is the city of Jericho. You can sing the song if you want to, but this is one way I'm not going to hear you. Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, the account in Joshua chapter 5 goes, he looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? In other words, Whose side are you on? I need to know, are you on our side or are you on their side? It's a classic question and it appears many times in the Bible. And the Bible gives a classic answer. Verse 14 of Joshua 5. Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I've now come. This may have taken Joshua a bit by surprise, but his faith was strong because Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him. What do you think he asked him? Well, what he asked him was this. What message does my Lord have for his servant? You see, straight away, Joshua realised that the question wasn't, is God on his side? But really, is he on God's side? You see, what he realised was that that type of question has been asked from the wrong perspective. That's the first person that we're going to look at. The second one is a political sect, really, the Herodians, who came with the Pharisees to Jesus to test him, to trap him. 
The issue is found in Matthew chapter 22, and it's not in the realm of the military, and it's the realm of politics. The Herodians came saying, Teacher, Jesus, we know that you are truthful and teach the way of God in truth and defer to no one, and you're not partial to any. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful for us to pay the poll tax to Caesar or not? It's quite contemporary, really. A couple of decades ago, we had the poll tax riots because they tried to introduce the poll tax into Britain. And people were asking that very question. Should we pay the poll tax to this government or not? Is it fair? Is it right? Is God on our side? perhaps not realising exactly who they were asking. They tried to put Jesus in the dock. And what a dilemma. Because if Jesus said, I'll oh, pay the poll tax, it's okay, he would have been seen to be one with the Romans, the occupying power, the hated power, and no leader of the Jews. If he, on the other hand, said don't pay it it's not right he would have been seen as an insurrectionist a political agitator a troublemaker by the romans what a dilemma for jesus to be in so what was his answer jesus said show me a coin used for the poll tax and they brought him a denarius and he said to them whose likeness and inscription is on this coin and they said to him, Caesar's. And then he said to them, then give to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar. And give to God the things that belong to God. As with Joshua, the question comes back to the question. We don't get an answer to our question, but we have to make an answer ourselves to the question Put back to us because the question here has been asked from the wrong motives the Herodians didn't really want an answer they were just trying to trap Jesus and instead the ball rebounded back onto them and now we move on to a woman a woman we don't know her name but we know that she came from the city of Sychar this is John chapter 4, and it's in the realm not of the military and not of politics, but of religion. Jesus had left Judea and went to Galilee, and the straight route would take him through Samaria. But Jews didn't do that. They avoided Samaria. They went round three sides of a square almost because they hated going through the Samaritan area. Jesus going through Samaria was a deliberate act. And Sychar was just beyond the fork in the road, the decision point. Are you going to go through Samaria and to Sychar? Or are you going to go the normal Jewish route and avoid Samaria altogether? Jesus chose the former. Not only that, but he sent his disciples away into the city. And he's sitting there talking with a woman at the well in the middle of the day. There's no one else there. No one else comes to the well in the middle of the day. The women of the town come much later, or perhaps first thing in the morning. And she doesn't want to be with them because, well, the story gives us her history. It doesn't worry Jesus at all. In fact, he's almost certainly sought her out deliberately. And he talks with her and the conversation ends up being about religion. And she says, sir, giving him some honour, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. And you people say that Jerusalem is the place where we ought to worship. Which is right, she wants to know. Are you right or are we right? And where is God in all this? Is he on our side or on your side? Now you probably know that Samaritans were half Jews. 
they were half Jews ethnically, they were partly descended from the Jews, but they were mixed race, and religiously too, because they had a truncated Bible. And they believed in the first five books, the books of Moses, and they didn't accept the rest. They were seen worse as Gentiles by true Jews who would have nothing to do with them. And yet here we have a Jewish rabbi talking to a Samaritan woman. She wants to know who is right. And Jesus gives the answer. Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. It's strangely redolent of the answer that was given to Joshua. Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither. And the Herodians saying, which should we pay poll tax to Caesar or not? And Jesus says, effectively, neither. But he goes on to say, an hour is coming, and now is, when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. There's a deeper issue here than who's right. There's a deeper issue here than just of geography. There is a spiritual reality here that needs to be unpacked. There will be a new dispensation. And all this him thinking about whether it's right in this area or in that area, that will all be consigned to history. The question was from the wrong assumption that this religious group is right and this one is wrong and God must be on the side of one of them. All these three people, Joshua from the point of view of the military, the Herodians from the point of view of politics and this woman looking at religion all tried to put God in the dock to ask a question and they all failed because respectively they had the wrong perspective, the wrong motives and the wrong assumption. I call my last witness. I said he was a president. Well, he presided over a large area of Palestine in the time of Jesus and his name was Pontius Pilate. And he held all three powers, military, political and religious. At least he tried to keep peace over all of them with some success and some failure. And Jesus was before Pilate and Pilate said to him, so you're a king? And Jesus answered, you say correctly that I'm a king. For this I've been born and for this I've come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Now he actually got a little bit further than almost anybody else. He engaged Jesus in quite a deep conversation, although it was a short one. The woman at the well may have engaged him in a slightly longer conversation. But this one was going right to the top of the tree. And Pilate then, in case he was wrong-footed, tries to put Jesus in the dock. Are you going to play ball, Jesus, or am I going to have to get tough with you? So he says, what is truth? Whose side, Jesus, are you on? Luke picks up the story and tells us that Pilate questioned him at some length, but Jesus answered him nothing. You don't get very far when you put God in the dock. That's really all we have to say about Pilate in this because then he washed his hands of the whole affair and tried to pretend he had nothing to do with it. But of course, every time we say the creed, we say the word suffered under Pontius Pilate because we can't airbrush out what really happened. We can't deny the truth of what happened. That is what it is and we have to live with that today. Simply pulling down history and trying to rewrite it doesn't really work. They tried that in the great totalitarian regimes of the 20th century and we found that that's not the way to go. So what do we do? But maybe one of the things that we've been learning 
pondering these different approaches is that this, what I called Daily Mail approach, is fatally flawed. Maybe the world is more complicated than that. Maybe just looking at things from a right and wrong point of view doesn't work in the real world. Maybe it's not, is God on my side? But am I on God's side? You see, all the people that we've looked at have had brains, power, pedigree and influence. Well, perhaps the woman at the well didn't have much influence, but they all certainly had human wisdom. But it wasn't enough. That's why Paul when he writes his theological treatise, which we call the Epistle to the Romans, writes this at the beginning of chapter 12. He says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Isn't that what we want, the will of God? That's what we want to know in any situation, whether it's Black Lives Matter, the re-election of Trump, whether it's the lockdown or anything else. What is the will of God in this? I love the translation of J.B. Phillips of this very verse. He calls it, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mould, but let God remould your minds from within. That's a big challenge. It's much easier to let our training, our history, our prejudices have their say. But no, instead we should be moulded by God himself to be changed into the likeness of Christ. And that's how we know what would Jesus do. It's only when we're soaked in scripture, held by the Holy Spirit, that we can be fielded by the Father into the world and deal with those deep questions in a mature way and leave the simplistic single issue politics behind. That's what Jesus would do. How would we do what Jesus would do?